Drive was actually an experience that was completely different than any other I had had before. Um, specifically, I have, in the last five or six years, come back to actually doing a lot of hands-on work, designing and mixing, whereas in the uh, late 90s and the early part of uh, 2000, there was a lot of oversight, bigger crews doing work and then having review sessions, etc. And in the last five or six years, um, I've gotten involved actually doing the work that um, is done by our designers and doing mixing and doing uh, the leveling in conjunction with the final mix. And in this case, I had our uh, director, Nick Reffin, in the studio with me for several days going through the movie and really blocking out how it was going to sound and taking things in, taking things out, and coming up with new things. And as opposed to sort of a standard process of um, having reviews and then going away and coming back and have other reviews, he just said, why don't you just fix that? We'll change this thing. And I said, great. And I started taking note. He said, no, no, I'll just hang out here. I'll, I'll hang out with you. And hmm. he said, I'll just make a phone call. And so that was the beginning of uh, several days of spending full days with him, which was a new experience for me and a wonderful experience. It's the way hmm. uh, most film editors work. But sound is usually not given that much attention um, and often because people don't, directors don't have the time because of a lot of simultaneous activities like color timing, and digital intermediates, and visual effects happening. But uh, Nick was really intent on um, that process, and it gave me a clear, clear direction that um, was new, and it, which was a very minimalist approach. One of the most unique things about Drive and the biggest challenges to wrap my head around as someone that's done a lot of bigger studio movies, was going into a world that's singular and does not have t many layers in it. It's singular and it's laser pointed to what's happening at the moment. And uh, that was a new thing for me. Because most mm. of the studio movies um, that come out of Hollywood purposely have a lot of density and a lot of richness and a lot of fullness in the soundtrack. And there's three. There's a lot of dimension to them in terms of background, and all stage scenarios, and things happening. And uh, in this case, this director said, "No, no, no. I don't want anything that's off stage that isn't in the character's perception of what he's doing in a given scene at a given moment." And mm -hmm. that's why Drive is so stark. And in its starkness, it's so um, engaging because there's nothing to take you away from the intensity of whatever is happening, you know, whether it's the character's joy, whether it's his angst, whether it's his trying to escape or something. And, uh, and that was a new experience, a wonderful experience for me. I, I agree. That's a, that, that kind of distinguishes the movie for, for me, too. But So that's an unusual dynamic for you to actually have the director there with you. Uh, do you find that directors... Uh, generally have, have a clear understanding of sound and what it means to their film? Uh, some do, and some have less of an understanding. You know, we work in a really subtle subtext. Uh, mm. I think that someone once said, you know, we're putting freckles on the face of the doll. But, and, and that refers to the, the little details that we work in. But in fact, the subtext of the sound is so important in terms of creating the mood and pushing the story forward and giving the characters things to put them in a space from an oral perspective. And some directors are, are excited about it. I'm currently doing The Hunger Games, and uh, Gary Ross, our director, you know, did the same thing, actually. He spent many, many days with me, and we went through and we organized in the same way how the movie was going to sound. So now that I know how to do that and I'm more comfortable doing it, you know, just from a personal standpoint, um, I would try and get more and more directors to do that. Yeah. And that was yeah. part of that experience was like at first when, when Nick said, well, I'll just stay here, you know, I'll, I'll be on the phone. I said, <laughs> I'm not used to doing this with, you know, someone here next to me. And uh, it turned out to be fine. And I, you know, it, it was just a real fun evolution for me because uh, it was a really great time. Yeah. Is there... Uh is there a particular scene or sequence in Drive that 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 you that you watch with particular pride uh, that that stands out to you in, in terms of the work that you, that you did? You know, 
there's many sequences in that film that I find are just so interesting. Um, I guess one of the, well, there's so many, but starting even at the beginning of the movie, the idea when he's uh, when he's escaping from the first robbery, mm-hmm. and you normally would think that, you know, he'd take off and the engines would be roaring and he would be trying to escape, but in fact, he's like a fish surrounded by sharks, which are the police, and when Driver first leaves, you know, instead of uh, having the engines roar and all that, there's just virtually no engine sounds. There's just the sound of the tires, and he's going super slow, and just pulls in behind a truck, and we see the police in the distance, and all you hear is the sound of the tires of the police car and it banging on a manhole cover, which I put in, and, you know, it lasers in on just what his perception is and how quiet it is, and it continues in this quiet mode until he's seen by this police helicopter, and once he's seen, the everything goes berserk, and the sound just blasts in with the helicopter, and the score that Cliff Martinez did builds and builds and then lets this this moment happen where he's just under the gun and you feel under the gun of the audience. Um, and then it quiets down again when he hides mm-hmm. underneath. You know, so it changes as he changes his scene. He hides under an aqueduct. Uh, when I first started, I said to uh, Nick, you know, did the, we did the research on the cars and the kind of engines they should have and all that. And I talked with uh, Nick and said, so do you want them to have this kind of engine, this and that? And he said, you know, I don't really care what kind of engines they are. I don't even have a driver's license. I've never driven a car. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I said, really? He said, really? I've never, I don't drive. He said, so make it exciting and don't pay attention to anything having to do with reality. Mm. And in fact, you see in the sequence, if you look closely, you will see that uh, Ryan Gosling, in a number of places, has his right hand on the steering wheel, what he couldn't possibly be shifting. Yet we have him shifting up, shifting down, things are happening. And uh, all of this was out of Nick saying, refer to the race through Paris that Claude Lelouch did in 1976, which is the point of view of a car racing through the streets of Paris, which is an amazing film, by the way. Uh, mm. Listeners should check it out. And it's a, and you just think this car is flying around the streets and this and that. And in fact, the car was going 35 miles an hour, and all the shifting and skidding and all the sounds is what made it seem incredible. And so we did the same thing, and, and it just was something totally uh, new for us and for me because, you know, there's so much intention to be real and to be proper, et cetera, et cetera, in most movies when it comes to, like, a car chase sound or something like that. And you would never do something like that where distinctly... You know, the sound could not be happening in a reality based <laughs> scene like that. Yeah. And it was just fun to do that because no one's ever noticed. <laughs> well, and I, I think get excited. I, I, I think of Drive and I think uh, about how kind of transfixing it is. And, and I think it goes along with how you're describing the, the, the soundscape of that initial sequence is that it kind of it lulls you, it transfixes and hypnotizes you in a way, and, and then just abruptly with with the kind of the the violence or the the scenes of action i mean that that's what i think of with uh with drive uh and so it, so it there, does. the yeah. whole piece the whole film has a lulling nature to it that is a handshake really a creative handshake between this Clint Martinez score and the sound design pieces that we put in where you can't tell which is which but it doesn't matter because it's all part of, like you say, this I sense of just being lulled into a, a place that you suspend your sense of any other reality. And even you start thinking about what are they saying and what's going on between them. Because there's very little dialogue in the film, too. Mm. And that's mm-hmm. another way to have the audience just go into it. And and they have, which has been such a wonderful thing to see as the film came out and as, you know, some people thought, well, it's not the action film it should be, or it doesn't, you know, it's supposed to be about a stunt guy and a guy that does heists, and it should be all action. And much to everyone's surprise, except our director, who knew all along, and the film editor, Matt Newman, it was like, this, is, this will draw people in. And mm. it has, as we can see from how, how it's been received. It's just uh, a lot of people, uh, even yesterday at the nominations launch, people were saying, this is the best movie I've seen all year. Wow. And I think that surprised a lot of people. <laughs> it it is a singular experience and but hearing you describe 
uh, the, the kind of the thought process and how it ties in with character and, and the situations of a particular scene when you're designing the sound. Uh, I mean, it makes me think about every person on a film crew is really an assistant storyteller. Uh, and I don't think people realize that uh, enough. Have you always kind of had a sense, uh, a strong sense of, of story? Always. Yeah. I mean, this, my sense of story is the reason I even got into this industry in the first place. I was so influenced as a kid by, you know, some of the great shows, you know, like Wild Wild West and Lost in Space, which was, you know, the, the shows that were on TV when in the, in the 60s. And I just was always taken by the stories that they conveyed and how you, you know, experience what the characters experience. And you could sort of leave your daily life and as a kid if you were just, you know, not that popular or not this or whatever. And you could just go into these characters and that's why I even got into this industry, was to communicate ideas. And I, um, just for one reason or another, it's a, it's a circuitous story, but ended up in the sound world as an 18-year-old with a, a sound company called Sound Deluxe that we started 30-some-odd years ago. Hmm. And we've been telling stories ever since. And you learn that early on, that the, you know, the key is to push forward the story points and create arcs in the story sonically, um, like a musical score. Because it is like a musical score. It's, it's subtextual, and the orchestrations that uh, are found in, in uh, any type of music, the subtext of those things besides the main melody are all supporting that melody. Yeah. And that's what we do all the time. From the littlest thing, you know, from the type of cricket you might select to the sound inside of a spaceship. And an excitement of a of a, a scene where a character is actually experiencing, you know, a, a chase scene is a scene that a character is experiencing great angst. They're either chasing someone or they're getting chased, mm. and they're going through a, an incredible emotional experience. And we can heighten that, then we're telling that story. I would think too the, a, 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 a particular challenge, because so so many movies that we see with well, the big tentpole studio action movies, in particular. I mean, we're used to the bombast uh, uh, from, from yeah. the yeah from the sound of those types of movies. But but it must be a particular challenge to know when to pull back on on the sound. You know, you are speaking to a person who always wants to pull back on the sound. Mm. I do not. In in all the films I've worked on, which have been a few over the last thirty some odd years, I never. Uh, support the idea of just bombastic, loud, assaulting sound. And you're seeing, you know, there's a whole evolution of the sound industry and how uh, the technologies have allowed from, you know, the Dolby 4-track to Dolby 6-track to digital. Each step has allowed sound to grow and do something more interesting. And once it goes through that arc of, wow, this is cool, then people pull back and get subtle and, and they start to pull things down. And you do see in some of the bigger movies that are well done, um, I think of Pirates, you know, where there were all these huge scenes, but they were smart enough to, to, to pull down and just choose something to concentrate on so you didn't have an assault. Mm -hmm. I think assaulting sound is not a cool thing, unless it should assault you specifically for a reason and for a short period. To have a 10-minute so assaulting yeah. sequence, you're just going to get pushed back and go, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not engaged. And much. there's a difference between movies that are exhausting to watch and those that make you feel more alert and elevated. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and leaning in is part of that process. Leaning into the screen, leaning into the movie mm. at the right moments is part of being alert. And sometimes a quieter thing will make you lean in. You know, there's a balance between an image and the sonic nature of that image at all times in a motion picture experience. And either it's pushing you back from the screen or you're leaning into the screen or it's just right. And, you know, the goal is to know how to manipulate that and just not have you leaning in all the time going, what do you say? Or being pushed back, feeling yeah. like it's too loud. You want to yeah. be mostly in the just right range. And occasionally when the story calls for it, you want to be pushed back. Or you also want to, you do want to say, what do you say? What do you say? You know, because maybe the story at that moment is, it's not clear, and it shouldn't be clear. But that mm -hmm. should come from the script. It shouldn't yeah. come from cool sounds. It's back to st back to story again. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, I speak to actors or cinematographers, and I ask for their best, greatest examples of their favorite cinematography or what have you. Do you have kind of tent tent poles in terms of movie sound, particular films that you think are the, the best examples of the use of sound? Well. <laughs> Like most people, I would probably hark it back to Apocalypse Now, which was one mm. of the most amazing uh, sound experiences that I've ever had. And the, the journey going through that, I, I saw, I was, I don't know, uh, a young man at Filmex in 1983 when I saw that at the uh, Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. But opening, the night it opened, I think I, I don't know how I got into the screening, but I was sitting in the first or second row, and I was just like, wow. And you just get drawn in, and, and it takes you on an incredible journey. So I'd say that was probably one of the most influential sonic experiences uh, that I've ever had and, and experienced. It was a great thing. And seeing that in the Cinerama Dome, I mean, that's, that would be the ideal setting for Apocalypse Now. It was, a, it was ideal. See the helicopter going around, having the sound go around to the surrounds and then just disappear from the screen with nothing but the forest and then or the jungle and then there it comes back around again. It was just, it blew my mind. Well, I said I'm in. Well, I I hate I hate to end with such a pedestrian question, but uh I mean this comes up every every year when the Oscar nominations are announced. And we see these two separate sound categories uh for editing and mixing. And there's and there's always a question in, you know, movie fans minds, what is the difference between the two? Well, it's not a pedestrian question because it, it actually has a big backstory, and I'll just try and keep it as short as possible. The difference between the two is that the Best Sound Award is for the mixing side of the process, which includes the production mixer who is on the set and the re-recording mixers who do the final mix. The Sound Editing Award, which for many years was a Special Achievement Award, is now a permanent award, but was a Special Achievement Award, uh, is for the designing and editing of those sounds, the gathering of them, the editing of them, the putting them in the picture, and the coming up with how the picture is going to sound through that process. Mm. That being said, those were legacy separations that go back to the days when you couldn't listen to more than one sound until you got to the mixing stage because you had to, you only had a moviola which had one sound head. So you had to imagine how all the sounds would come together, and it wasn't until the mixers could put them on a faders and all the playback machines that you could even hear them together. But what's happened since then, the, the technology has completely become modern, as it has in everything. And with the use of the Pro Tools device, now you can um, mix 190 or more tracks uh, on a laptop. Mm -hmm. So the connection between the levels of sound, the equalization, the echo, the placement, are happening um, earlier and earlier in the process. And in the design phase, like I mentioned earlier, when you sit with a director in, a, in the studio when you're first putting things together, you don't just play sounds. You place them, you reverb them, you make them, ha you know, you sketch them out in a fair amount of detail. And so the difference between those, oh, oh so, but to finish that thought, and then you go to the stage and then the mixers aren't first hearing them for the first time going, what is this, how do I even play it? They can then mm -hmm. elevate the process to a whole new level. So they have a different job than they once had, which is to even just play the sound. And um, I don't know how, how, you know, there's a big split on the political nature of this comment, but I do believe that there should be one award and it should mm. evolve as the technologies evolve because um, that process is now iterative. We do temp dubs now that are like final mixes and the final mixes are updates to the temp dubs um, and the process is one, and uh, the idea of having a separate award for editing and mixing, um, I believe, is a legacy um, is a legacy way of looking at it. And I know that there are people that fought very hard to get the Sound Editing Award to be a permanent award, and I get that. We all fought hard for it to be a permanent award. But I also think things have evolved and changed, and uh, the BAFTAs look at uh, as the Sound as one award, which includes the sound designers and the makers. Mm -hmm. and the production mixers. and um, Anyway, I hope that explains the difference and also the evolution of it. Because, uh, no, that we're did. We're a big team now. We're a big team. We all work together. 
I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to you for explaining that, so I no longer have to try to come up with an answer when I'm asked. <laughs> I, mean, I understand the it now. Mixers are, the mixers are, I, I think they're all enjoying it, because when this first started, they used to say, five years ago, they said, well, turn off your volume graph. I don't want your volume graphing. That was the attitude then. Now, mixers are thrilled, because they get it already in the, you know, in the ballpark or even in the pocket, and now they can work on really great details of equalization, great details of reverbs, placement, and they have, they're have they elevating it another step. There's no doubt. I would never say they're not, because um, they are. And yeah. they have the time to do that now, instead of just playing stuff for the first time and, you know, saying, do these work together? Do these work together? We know they work together, the sound. Mm. And so mm. this process of mixing is a whole better experience for everyone, the director, the mixer, everyone. How's how's Hunger Games looking? Fantastic, it's fantastic. Yeah. We're we're uh, about a week and a half into the final mix, and this is a very special movie. And I know it's a high profile. A lot of people are looking forward to seeing it, but when they hear it, they're also going to 